Thank you, Joe. Good evening, everyone. Can you see down there? Big, big angle. All right. I'm going to talk about several things here tonight and introduce some of the tricky politics relating to climate change and, talk, and bring those up toward the end as a focal point for some of the discussion, perhaps. Uh, but I'll start off talking a little bit about some of the climate change that, that's, that's going on. I want to talk especially about uh, precipitation, storms, water, um, the mountains, and, uh, and what climate change means for that. But we start off with this uh, canonical picture of the postcard picture of the uh, polar bear who's back in the news actually at the moment because the polar bear's in trouble because of vanishing uh, sea ice. So he's crawling, calling for help. And a brief summary of this problem. What's the best place for me to stand? I don't want to stand in front of it and block people if I can. Um, is, is that the planet is running a fever and you know, if I went to see the doctor, the symptoms are that the planet's temperature is rising and also carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is increasing. I'll show you the uh, evidence for that shortly. The diagnosis then is that human activities are causal. The prognosis is that there is going to be more warming at rates that can be disruptive and will cause strife. And the treatment is so-called mitigation, which means in this case reducing emissions and stopping the buildup of carbon dioxide. And then secondly, recognizing that climate change is coming, ready or not, and adaptation, planning for the consequences is highly desirable and we're really not doing enough of either. So uh, we've got, those are the sort of things we're going to talk about. So the first rule of management is that you can't manage what you can't measure. And one of the key things about the, the climate system uh, is that we have a lot of measurements. We have a lot of observations. You see some benefit of those every night in the weather forecast from the atmospheric standpoint. And Patrick Daniel Moynihan said, you're entitled to your own opinion, but not your own facts. <laughs> and so I'm going to come back to that because we think that we have a lot of facts, a lot of hard evidence, and that then you can build, uh, build the case that something ought to be done, but exactly what is done is certainly a debatable aspect of this. So we have many facts. We have physical understanding as well. And however, to make those decisions, the facts are not enough. And the role of people like me as a scientist is to lay out the facts and the prospects and the consequences as we see them as best we can. We do a lot of what if kind of things and, and then we try to answer those. Uh, but the decision on what to do is not ours. Uh, it involves everyone, it involves you which is why I'm here, to try and inform you about the basis for what the kinds of decisions that need to be made. And unfortunately, it involves politics. 97% uh, of scientists, however, agree that climate change is a real problem. And this is much, much higher than for the general public and vastly higher than uh, a lot of politicians. Um, so we can say that the data are of mixed quality and length, but together they actually tell a very compelling story that global warming is happening, that climate change is happening, and that the humans are the main cause of that. And what we do about this involves value systems very much and politics. So what's causing the warming? We are. Let's see if this works. There we go. And so, uh, and so this, I don't know if you've seen this kind of figure. This, this shows you the overall sources of our energy. And what is perhaps surprising is how rapidly this goes up after about the 1960s. And most of the energy that has been uh, used by humans is in relatively recent years. And most of it is from fossil fuels. So there's a little bit from renewables and biomass and from uh, nuclear power uh, down the bottom. And one of the consequences of this since 1950, 
2008, uh, there have been measurements at Mauna Loa of carbon dioxide, and this is the actual record uh, of that. And there's a sawtooth character to it, and so in the northern hemisphere, uh, spring and in the summer the, the planet sort of breathes in and takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere with photosynthesis as the planet, as the northern hemisphere greens up. And then in the fall when the leaves fall from the trees and the twigs and so on um, to the forest floor and, and so on, um, this time of year now uh, the decay sets in and carbon dioxide goes back up. And you can see that this uh, natural annual cycle is is really quite large in terms of the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and yet it's dwarfed by an overall upward trend. And I want to point out to you some characteristics of this upward trend. So the rates of change are actually increasing. And this should be very worrying because there have been agreements like the Kyoto Protocol that were designed to turn this down in the other direction. And instead, it's increasing at an, ever, uh, at, an, at an ever greater rate. And in fact, the last year, the, the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was greater than any other year on record. We're not going in the right direction on this curve. And well, uh, so here's, here's the overall response of the system. This is the global mean temperature. And there's a certain raggedness to this thing, up and downs, uh, bumps in it, and, and so on. Um, as best we can put this thing together. And then this is the annual values of carbon dioxide here. The scale is given over here. The pre-industrial numbers are around 280 parts per million by volume. The current values are at 400 parts per million by volume. So over 40 percent increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has occurred. There's no doubt about this and there's no doubt that it's caused by humans. And I've put these together in this way to suggest that there's a relationship between them because we think we can prove that there is. But you can see there's a lot of fluctuations from year to year and even from decade to decade that are not related to the increases in carbon dioxide. And so this relates to the natural variability in the, in the climate system, the, the weather uh, and related effects. So there's been a lot of focus. This is now blowing up the period after 1970. This is the main period where global warming, the human influence, is really identifiable and has kicked in. And I've put a straight line through this curve here. And it's actually a pretty good fit overall. In fact, the biggest departure from this straight line is this year here, 1998, which is the warmest year last century. And some of you may know that was that was the year, 1997-98, was the year of the big El Nino. And that's the time when the term El Nino came into the American vernacular. And so in recent times, it's, uh, the values have been running slightly below the curve. This year, values are likely to be the highest on record, but not by much. They'll be just slightly higher than these two values here, somewhere up here, but pretty much on track with the overall uh, linear increase that seems to be occurring uh, with a few exceptions. Most of the big jumps in here turn out to be El Nino events. But one of the things which has happened in the denier community is they've pointed to 1998 and said, oh look, there's no warming or not much warming since 1998. And so the rate of warming in this recent period is somewhat less. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm uh, getting over a cold. I'm going to lose my voice at some point. That's why this water is here. And, and so this is clearly cherry picking, uh, but it does highlight the fact that the rate of increase of the global mean temperature seems to be somewhat less. But at the same time, the temperatures in the 2000s has been much higher than the 1990s or the 1980s or the 1970s or any other year on record. And so one of the things which I've spent a bit of time doing, which I'm not going to talk very much about, but I can answer questions about it, is you know, just why this occurs. And I'll give you a few hints along the way. So one of the hints is that this is a, a replot of this curve, now using 12-month running means instead of annual values. And so it's just a, a little bit, got a little bit more structure to it. And what I've done here is to put the El Nino events and the La Nina events on here. The La El Ninos are in this. Um, uh, beige color, 
and the La Niñas are in, in blue. This is the actual time series of them down here. So this, the biggest event was 1997, 98. Uh, is this record here? You know, it only lasts. The El major El Nino's event only lasts about a year or so, and we're sort of in one now. Um, this this coming winter looks like being a relatively weak El Nino event. And with El Nino events, at the end of El Nino events, heat comes out of the ocean and is part of, partly responsible for why that year is so warm. So the the biggest peaks occur in association with El Nino events. Um, at the end of the El Nino event, that's when you get the peak and then the temperature tends to drop. And so some of these fluctuations are associated with heat being taken up by the oceans in the blue times when the La Ninas occur and then released into the atmosphere during El Ninos. So we'll see a little bit more about that in aspects of the rest of the talk. Another aspect of this is that if we break this down by season, this is the conventional sort of meteorological seasons. This is December, January, February, the Northern Hemisphere winter. So in blue, you'll see the biggest fluctuations tend to occur in the Northern Hemisphere winter in blue. That's because El Ninos tend to peak in uh, around December, typically. That's why it's actually called El Nino. The Nino refers to the Christ child. And if we look at the blue curve, you know, you can draw a line like this and say, whoa, what's happening here? And so this is some of the cold winters that have occurred in Europe in recent times. And last year, of course, the eastern half of the United States was exceptionally cold. And so something a bit funny has been going on in the wintertime. And it's not something I'm going to have time to go into great detail. I'll touch on it very briefly uh, with a, a, a little movie loop that uh, I'll show you a little bit later. And so what happens when we have global warming? This increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which traps the radiation, which is normally trying to escape to space. We have the incoming radiation from the sun. And to keep a balance, the outgoing radiation has to, has to match that. And living in Colorado, you will know with the diurnal cycle, you have the sun blazing down. And then when the sun sets, boy, it can cool off quickly. And it doesn't happen like that in the east. And why is that? And it's because of all the water vapor that exists in the east or at, at, at low levels. And we don't have much water vapor up here at elevation. And as a result, water vapor is a greenhouse gas. And it illustrates that's the reason why we have these large fluctuations from day to night is the absence of a strong greenhouse effect up here. We have a greenhouse effect from carbon dioxide, and that helps. And the other time, of course, when we get rather warm nights is when we have cl clouds. So clouds also have a greenhouse effect and do a similar kind of thing. So when we increase this blanket of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, uh, methane, and, and so on, um, there's increased heat that has to go somewhere. And where does it go? Well, it warms the land and the atmosphere. I've shown you a little bit of evidence for that. Most of it, turns out, goes into the ocean. And it goes into the ocean in different ways over time, which I'll talk about briefly. That raises sea level. And I'll show you some sea level numbers shortly. It also melts land ice. Um, it melts glaciers. It melts Greenland, which puts more water into the ocean, which raises sea level. Uh, so these are both symptoms. Uh, sea, rising sea level uh, has two aspects of it relating to this problem. It also melts sea ice. And Ar Arctic sea ice has been melting an enormous amount. And then the, warm, the, the frozen water has to get uh, melted, uh, warmed up. And then some of the tricky parts relate to weather. It evaporates moisture. Uh, changes the rainstorms. Uh, it, it changes the cloudiness. <coughs> Excuse me. That um, can reflect more of the sun's rays, and so that can actually change the energy balance itself. And this is the really tricky part of the overall problem. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So over ninety percent goes into the ocean. <laughs> Excuse me. So this is, you've probably seen things like this, and, and I haven't tried to update these, but these are pictures sort of before and after of different uh, glaciers around the world, and there are many of these kinds of things now. 
showing that indeed there's been major retreats of, of glaciers. And uh, if you go to Glacier National Park uh, to the north of here, you'll find there's not that many glaciers left there. <coughs> and then, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and then the Arctic sea ice. Uh, 2012 was the record low value. There's been about a 40% decrease in Arctic sea ice since we've had good measurements in the 1970s. Uh, the last couple of years have been slightly higher, uh, but the overall trend is, is steadily down, but there's quite a bit of variability from one year to the next. This is uh, the best estimates of global sea level. Uh, prior to 1992, these were estimates based upon coastal stations and islands uh, and gauges uh, on those locations. They, it wasn't really global, and so there's a fair bit of uncertainty in, in aspects of this. Now, but you can see, I think, that the rate of change has, has, uh, has changed, and so the increase is now occurring at a more rapid rate than it has in the past. And whether something like this is real or not, um, I suspect not. But um, we'll see. So we can blow up the more recent period because in 1992, uh, joint with the French, NASA launched a, a satellite into space with an altimeter on board that's actually making measurements of the global ocean to millimeter accuracy. And on a global basis, about every 16 days, you get one of these circles. And this is uh, the global estimate of, of sea level uh, relative to um, an average where the, the, the mean annual cycle has been taken out. You can see several things in here actually. This, this is the 1997-98 El Nino. And then there was a spectacular event right here which was during the last major La Nina when there was a tremendous amount of rain on Australia and it formed a big lake in Australia so much that it actually dropped the sea level by uh, four or five millimeters relative to the straight line curve and in, because Australia doesn't have rivers, a riverine system, uh, the, the lake sat on Australia for about 18 months and then eventually uh, the water got back into the ocean and, and it continued on its merry way. And so the rate of sea level rise is about 3.2 millimeters per year. 3.2 millimeters per year. You remember a ruler, a uh, one foot ruler is about 30 centimeters. So this is just a little over one foot per century is the current rate of sea level rise. And so there's two major parts to that. One is that the ocean is expanding, and the other is that we're putting more water into the ocean. Up until about 2003, probably a bigger contribution came from the ocean expanding. But in more recent times, uh, the melting of, of Greenland and, and, and a bit of Antarctica and, and glaciers has probably contributed a greater amount to, to this uh, increase in sea level. And so there's no doubt that the planet is warming, no doubt whatsoever. So uh, if we look at patterns of this, this is the overall linear trend plotted at each location around the world, um, not quite for the full period, but actually from August 1993 to July 2013, sort of just to round off the number of years. And what we find is that the biggest increase in sea level during this period occurred over here in the Western Pacific near the Philippines. And so the number here is 16 millimeters per year. 16 millimeters per year. That's an incredible amount. Uh, over, um, over, what, a 20 year period. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, uh, in this region here, sea level had actually dropped a little bit. And so although the global sea level has gone up, there, ha there have been changes in the climate system. And in particular, what we have shown is that there have been increases in the trade winds across here that are scooping up the water from the eastern Pacific and dumping it in the western Pacific, piling it up over there. And as a result, there is very warm, deep water over in the far western Pacific. So one of the consequences of this last November is that Super Typhoon Haiyan developed right in that region and, de and went right through the Philippines. And so 
there are two aspects to this. Firstly, the warm deep water in that region fed this particular typhoon, made it much bigger and more intense than it otherwise would have been. And then secondly, the sea level was about a foot higher than it otherwise would have been. And as a result, the storm surge was absolutely devastating. And so there are two aspects of the human-induced climate change that led to the devastation in the Philippines last November. Now since then, sea level has dropped by several inches over here, and sea level has actually gone up by several inches over here. Um, I don't know, three or four inches. Not a huge amount in association with this developing El Nino. And it remains to be seen what's going to happen this winter as to how much that continues. Uh, but that has the potential for making big changes uh, to California and the California drought. And I'll, so I'll say a little bit more about that in just a minute. So one of the, um, so I'm one of the authors of, of a paper that was published that received quite a lot of attention and for the first time we were able to reconstruct the ocean heat content. Uh, and here it is for the upper 300 meters. There's um, actually five different versions of this on here to try and reflect the errors that we have. And this is what it looked like for the top 300 meters over time. Then this is what it looked like for the top 700 meters. And then this is what it looks like for the, for the full depth ocean. Actually, this is really the top 2,000 meters. There's really no data below about 2,000 meters. And you can see the uncertainties in that are quite a bit greater. And so in these curves, there is quite a lot of structure, quite a lot of embroidery. And so this is the source of some of it. Firstly, there was a big volcanic eruption here called Mount Agung. And there was a sharp cooling that occurred that took heat out of the ocean and out of the overall climate system at that time. There was another major eruption called El Chichan that went off in 1982 that also caused a very sharp cooling. And there was another one, the biggest one in recent times, was Mount Pinatubo in 1991 that caused a very sharp cooling. Um, these, the cooling from these things lasts, what, what's plotted on here is actually an 18 month strip and you can see it's probably a little longer than that. And then the other thing I've highlighted on here is the 1997-98 El Nino and as I said during El Nino events, during La Nina events there tends to be a build up of heat a little bit and then during El Nino events there's a loss of heat and you can see that that loss of heat occurring in here and if you looked at the tropical Pacific alone you would see that that was actually much greater and it actually continued on for about five years and it seemed to kick the ocean into a different kind of behavior altogether. And so after this time, it turns out, after this time, a lot more heat has been going deeper into the ocean. You can see these curves are sort of paralleling one another reasonably well up till about here. And since then, a lot more heat has been going deep into the ocean. And it relates to the changes in winds, which related to that change in sea level that we saw earlier. And so a lot more heat has been going down below 300 meters, which means it's not available at the surface and it's not reflected in the surface temperatures. But the planet is still heating up. And some of it, a lot more of it than any time in previous to this, has gone below 700 meters into the deeper part of the ocean. So the ocean is warming up in even deeper layers. And this is only new since 1999. And that, we believe, is the reason why the global mean surface temperature has leveled off. It's mainly because more of the heat has been going deeper into the ocean. It's being disposed of, if you like, in different ways. It doesn't have to reflect itself in the surface temperature record. So the other aspect of this is if you've got extra heat, what happens to the heat? Well, what happens if you heat the human body? We sweat. And the way in which we keep cool is if that sweat evaporates. It works very well out here in Colorado. And we can use this also as evaporative coolers out here in Colorado. So we moisten the atmosphere, but it keeps the atmosphere cooler because of the evaporative effects. And this works very well, it turns out, for planet Earth. 70% of the planet Earth is ocean. And so if there's heat 
What does it do? It doesn't actually cause an increase in temperature for the most part. The first thing it does is it uh, causes evaporation. What happens if there's evaporation? There's more moisture in the atmosphere. Where does that moisture go? It gets caught up in storms. It invigorates the storms. So I want to talk about that aspect of these things now because it's a very important part and one which is very poorly understood. Another example, you know, if it's been raining outside, uh, the sun comes out, the first thing that happens is that the puddles dry up and then the temperature increases. And so the heat goes into drying as long as there is moisture around. And this is very important in Colorado because here we're wa water limited somewhat. We actually import, export quite a lot of water in our rivers uh, and we have a big source of water in the form of snow. But uh, as we know, we don't get a lot of rain here and so it's very easy to, to have a drought and we've had a few of those and I'll talk about those a little bit. So why does it rain? The rain shaft in this case is hidden behind this, this bar here. But let me just talk about that a little bit. This is one number. If you want to learn a new number, if you haven't heard this one before, warmer air holds more moisture. And the, the, number, the amount is 4% per degree Fahrenheit or 7% per degree Celsius. And over the oceans, as long as there's plenty of water around, that's exactly what happens. And so as the oceans warm up, the air above it warms up, and now over the global oceans there's about 5% more moisture in the atmosphere than there used to be. About 5%. So, since 1970. Since 97. Maybe add an extra percent for the whole century. Something like that. Because the global oceans have warmed up by about 1 degree Fahrenheit. And the air temperatures warmed up by, by tad, maybe a tad more than that. Over land, it varies in general in numbers like 2 to 3 percent. Over deserts, of course, there's no moisture supply, and so there's been no increase in moisture. And, and so it, it varies a little bit over land, and it depends on the moisture supply as to what the consequences of this are. So as long as moisture is available. So let's take a parcel of air. We've got one here. Um, so what happens? Uh, the sun comes out, uh, the air gets heated up, and uh, it becomes more buoyant and starts to rise. And as it rises, it moves into thinner air, less pressure, and so it expands. And so it forms a cloud. The, air can, the water condenses. And then the next thing you know, wait for it. There, here it is. Uh, and it rains like hell. So that's, uh, that's the rain process. And so this is a very natural process that warmer air holds more moisture. It's why we have weather. It's why we have weather. But if we warm the atmosphere, it's apt to have more moisture that gets caught up in the weather systems, and that has consequences. So if there's more heat, there's more drying, there's more evaporation, there's more moisture. And so in places where it's raining, it rains harder. But in places where it's not raining, things dry out quicker. You develop heat waves. You develop the risk of wildfire much more quickly. And so it has consequences. It doesn't, it's, at the moment, the, the effects are not big enough to really change these things in a major way. But the fact that there's more drying and more moisture in the atmosphere has consequences at both ends. We expect droughts and floods to increase as a consequence of global warming. And so here's a big uh, thunderstorm. And the main way in which it rains, I don't know if you've ever thought, you know, how much does it rain over the planet? Anyone know a number? I, th I think a reasonable, I mean, it depends on the threshold. You know, do you count really light rain? Do you count really light diamond dust snow or something like that? But it's probably about 7% of the globe. Over the oceans, it's about 10%. And so why doesn't it rain everywhere at once? which is sort of what the Bible would imply during Noah's flood or something like that, but it can't. And in fact, the, when it rains, the, the rain comes from the convergence of moisture by the winds into the storm. In other words, it's the moisture that's laying around in the atmosphere that feeds the storm. And if you're out on the golf course somewhere or hiking somewhere and you start to feel gusts, What's going on? And then you look and you see over in the distance, maybe it's five miles away or something, there's a thunderstorm developing. That thunderstorm is actually reaching out with its winds and the circulation as a part of the storm 
in gathering in the moisture and bringing it into the storm so that it can dump it down. And that's how it can rain so hard. It's not because of evaporation. The rates of evaporation are an order of magnitude less than the rates of rainfall. Evaporation is occurring all of the time. But rainfall can occur in incredible amounts. And the way in which it happens is through the weather systems reaching out and gathering the moisture that's in the environment. And so if there's more moisture in the environment, it rains harder. And that's what we observe very well around the United States. That's what's happening. Now, in addition, more precipitation tends to fall as rain rather than snow. I've lived in Boulder for 30 years. When I first came here, it never used to rain in December or January. It does now. Um, snow melt occurs faster and sooner in the spring. And so the snowpack tends to be less in general as you get into the late spring and therefore soil moisture is less as the summer arrives and that's when of course most of the heat is available that's when you need the moisture to produce evaporative cooling and not to uh, dry out all of the plants and so the risk of drought increases substantially in summertime along with wildfire this is actually the Heyman wildfire in, in Denver in 2002 which was a substantial drought year in Colorado so here's the actual records. This is the record of temperature for the United States. It only goes through 2012. I haven't updated it here. Uh, there's a, several lines on here. These are actual annual values, and this actually goes for the calendar year. Uh, and you can see sort of a, a, a green curve, which is sort of a five-year running average, and then an overall trend. So there's definitely an upward trend and you can see some numbers on here this is uh, 51 degrees this is 54 so there's been uh, two or three a couple of degree increase in the in the temperature for the US and down the bottom here I've got the precipitation you can see tremendous amount of variability from year to year but also a bit of an upward trend uh, in that but I want to point out a few things here firstly back in the 1930s it was extremely dry and it was extremely hot that's when all of the hot year years occurred uh, prior to 2012. That's the so-called Dust Bowl era and the reason it was hot is because there was no moisture to produce evaporative cooling and, uh, and so these dry years are the ones which tend to be the hottest years. That's especially true in the summer half of the year. For precipitation I wouldn't characterize it as a straight line increase. In fact there was not much change here up until about the 1970s or thereabouts and then there was a jump to higher levels. And this jump occurred east of the Rockies. And it's been wetter east of the Rockies ever since then. And in fact, if we went back to this climate here up to the 1970s, there would be a lot of places in serious trouble in the eastern part of the United States because they would not have enough water for their crops and, and the demand that exists. What else? What did I do there? Nothing. So here's 2012 right at the end here. This is by far the warmest year on record for the United States. Uh, and it was also quite a dry year, but not as dry as some of these earlier years in the century. Now that's pretty scary, isn't it? You remember 2000 and, you know, I mean, so this, the cost of the, the dryness here was somewhere around $75 billion, something like that. So if we look at Colorado in the same way, okay, here's the temperature record for Colorado. It's a little bit even more up and down, but there's a, a steady uh, increase overall. Uh, and the, the precipitation has a somewhat different character to it overall. And in particular, it was especially cold and wet from 1905 to 1928. So that's this period here, and so it was cold and it was wet. So this contributes to the upward trend, but it was also very wet at this time. This, is, this turns out to be very important because what happened, uh, well firstly here's the 1930, it doesn't show up as well as in the, in the national values, but there was certainly some dry years here and uh, also uh, one very hot year uh, here. And then 2012 was, uh, was the record breaker also in Colorado and it was, it was very dry. Uh, illustrating the point again, dry, the heat goes with, uh, with, uh, with dryness. And then this was the period in 1922 when the Colorado Compact uh, 
was signed. This is when all of the water allocation occurred in the southwest. And it was based on a period where the rainfall was higher than it has ever been since. And so the water is over allocated. I've got a slide where I could go into that in more detail if you're interested, but I'll, I'll move on. I'll just say that for now. So here's the summary for the mountains, the sort of things we expect to see in Colorado with regard to climate change. Firstly, it's a continent. It gets cold in winter. We will still have winter. Some people forget that. The snow season, however, is apt to get a bit shorter at each end. Um, the glaciers retreat. There's amplified changes that occur in the mountains associated with that, associated with what is called snow feedback. So if the snow melts, there's a darker soil underneath, there's more, or more of the sun's rays are absorbed, and so it gets even warmer still. There's more snow, however, potentially in midwinter. Uh, because the atmosphere can hold more moisture, as long as it's cold enough, when it, does when it does snow, when it does precipitate, it's apt to produce even more snow than it would, um, would have done in the past. The snow melt uh, occurs sooner and the runoff peaks earlier, the stream flow peaks earlier. Uh, so there's less snowpack by the late spring and therefore the prospects are for less water in the summertime. And so this has consequences for things like drought, uh, heat waves, wildfires, the greater risk, and we've seen some examples of that in recent years, and expansion of pests uh, like the bark beetle and, and, and some others, um, because the, the real cold doesn't, doesn't kill them off. So that's a quick summary of what we expect. And now I thought I'd just touch on some of the recent extremes that have occurred mainly in the US, but I'll touch br briefly on some of the others. And so 2012 was spectacular. This was the overall uh, values for the uh, relative to normal of the, of the US. And it was only in the Pacific Northwest where it was uh, slightly below normal. Otherwise, all, all across the country was uh, at record high temperatures and all kinds of records were broken. And so around here in Colorado, there were uh, substantial wildfires, the Waldo Canyon fire, uh, uh, near Colorado Springs, uh, 346 homes, uh, the High Park fire up near uh, Fort Collins, uh, another 259 houses were lost. Uh, this is a picture of, of uh, Boulder where uh, I'm located and that's actually NCAR if, if any of you have been there. So the fire was about one and a half kilometers away from us at that time. So there were fires all over the place. And then later on in, the, in this year, we had Superstorm Sandy, and there's been a nice study that's been done now showing that Superstorm Sandy was more intense, it was bigger, uh, and, uh, and the rainfall was heavier, uh, the winds were stronger as a consequence of climate change. The sea level rise uh, contributed to the storm surge, and I think the odds are quite good that the subways and the tunnels between Brooklyn and, and, and Manhattan and between uh, Hoboken, uh, the PATH train, uh, New Jersey to, to Manhattan would not have been flooded if it hadn't been for climate change. There was over $70 billion in damages and I reckon probably about $40 billion of that you can assign to climate change. So this is just a quick summary because there's so many of them and we're just looking at 2013. I mean Australia is, is perhaps, uh, if you wanted to choose an overall poster child for this, um, they have uh, all kinds of uh, uh, records being broken both in terms of uh, drought and heat waves but also in terms of floods. Uh, here's the uh, follow-up Colo Colorado wildfires, the, what was it called, the, the Black Diamond wildfire or something down there, Colorado Springs, with the drought in the, in the west at this time. California wildfires, the biggest, this is the Rim Fire uh, later in the year. Uh, the 2013 is the driest year on record in California and that feeds into the California wildfires and Washington wildfires earlier this year. Uh, and wildfires are generally increasing through the western parts of the United States. Uh, in 2013, on the flooding side of things, uh, Buenos Aires in April, uh, Germany in, in June, uh, Calgary, really spectacular in the northern Rockies uh, from here. Tremendous uh, flooding and, and rains, heavy rains uh, in, the, in the Rockies. 
uh, India in June, and then Boulder, uh, very close to home. This is actually home um, in, in September. And so this is the overall increases in, in heavy precipitation. The trends are very pronounced in the United States, very clear and coinciding pretty well with when, when global warming has, has kicked in. And then also in November, I mentioned it before, uh, Super Typhoon Haiyan uh, in the Philippines. So I put a couple of slides in here about the, the boulder flooding. And uh, I just thought I'd indicate to you, this is what actually happened at that time. This is the so-called water vapor channel. So this is uh, from space sampling the water vapor in the upper um, third or so, maybe half of the atmosphere. And there was a river of moisture that came right up into Colorado here that was feeding the floods in Colorado and it had its origin down here where there were record high sea surface temperatures actually down in here and subsequently as soon as that river shut off this became uh, a tropical storm and another tropical storm formed over here and hundreds of people lost their lives down in, down in Mexico uh, as a consequence of this and so there was a, a global warming component to the to the flooding in, in Colorado because of the very high sea surface temperatures that was feeding the moisture up into Colorado at that time. So in 2014, there was major flooding earlier this year in, in southern England. Uh, my hometown in Christchurch had uh, extensive flooding in March and April. Uh, the Midwest in this region here in, in April had extensive flooding. Uh, the Balkans in May, uh, you may have uh, seen that uh, in the news. Uh, a little bit in the East Coast. This was um, more a relatively short-lived event. Uh, India and Pakistan in September, not very long ago, uh, a big expansion of the Brahma Prucher. And so I thought I'd put this in to illustrate what I think happened this past uh, winter. And so here uh, is, in, in the past winter, there was some warming of the ocean going on in this region over here, north of Australia, with the start of the current El Nino event that's going on. And that warm water has spread across the Pacific and, and is uh, one of the reasons why 2014 is the warmest year on record. And so under normal circumstances, I may have to go over here to, to get the thing going. Um, let's see. So under normal circumstances, we have westerlies. Whoops. When I did that, it keep going. Ah. <laughs> Try to. I won't push the button this time. I don't know what happened there. Didn't, didn't like me pushing the button. So, so normally you have westerlies with lows and high pressure systems in them, and they move from uh, west to east, something like that. And then what happens when you have extremely heavy rainfalls in the tropics that are sort of locked in place by the sea temperatures is that it tends to lock the waves in middle latitudes uh, in place. And it spins up in the northern hemisphere an anticyclone in the upper part of the atmosphere and that has consequences. It pushes the low pressure downstream and, and uh, you can see it sort of spinning up there in the region where the yellow has occurred and then it pushes a ridge downstream across Alaska and into uh, California and then there's this great big trough on the eastern part of the United States and that's the pattern that developed over this past winter. And so this is what was responsible for the drought in California and it, there was extremely warm temperatures in Alaska and all the way up into the Arctic. Uh, that's what happened uh, just recently, last week or so. Uh, and then there's this cold air that came down persistently and it was all locked in place by events that were going on in the tropical Pacific back here. So that's a, a, a quick schematic of that at least. So now I'm, I'm finished with uh, science for now. I want to talk a little bit more about our role in society. And my comment is that the science knowledge is going in one direction, but the political views have been going in another. Uh, there have been many reports. There was a recent one by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, after a, a major assessment that has occurred over the last couple of years, and uh, also by the AAAS and uh, the National Research Council, the National Advisory, National Academy of Sciences. Many reports 
that emphasize that uh, the climate change problem is a real one. Uh, there was a survey done of 10,855 climate studies published in peer-reviewed literature, and only two rejected anthropogenic climate change. However, when we look at the uh, current, in particular the Republican caucus in the House of Representatives, 56% deny the basic tenets of climate change, and there are 30 members of the Senate Republican caucus that also deny the reality of climate change. And in fact, it's not a coincidence that 160 members of the 113th Congress have taken $59 million from the fossil fuel industry. Is there a relationship? <laughs> you can uh, deduce that yourself, perhaps. <laughs> Just look at what happened in this past election and the awful advertising. I think it's terrible. Uh, anyway, uh, this problem is really a tragedy of the commons, um, which I would sort of paraphrase as saying it's everyone for themselves uh, that nobody is looking after the, the common, the common good. And the atmosphere is a global common, but it's also used as a dumping ground for any time we burn something. We put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Every time you breathe, you put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And so the solution does require the peoples of the earth to work together. And so you've seen some evidence of that recently with uh, Obama uh, in China and, uh, and more recently at the G20 even, in spite of the Australians, uh, the Australian Prime Minister not wanting climate change to be on the G20 agenda. So my comment is that we're all together on the spaceship Earth and, and what one country does affects all of the other countries because we only have this one atmosphere and the air that's over China at one time uh, is over the United States about five or six days later, and then five or six days later it's over Europe. The air is shared around the planet. However, when you start to talk about this way, or think about this way, uh, to many people this maybe suggests some form of altruism, and, and immediately sharing the money, uh, well-being profits that have been so carefully accrued to help other people. Uh, how, how do you deal with this? And, and what are your value systems in, in, in addressing this kind of a problem? And so this is where uh, some of the approaches to this begin to really rear their head, and it's related very much to the value systems underlying these kinds of considerations and how much you might uh, have an altruistic view of the planet versus, um, versus this is mine and uh, I'm going to keep it. So, you know, our society is founded on the premise of cheap and available fossil fuels. Um, it's continuing with all of this uh, fracking that's going on, and it doesn't take into account the external costs of using those. And so this is where uh, I think there ought to be a, a principle of user pays. Why shouldn't, when you burn something, you also pay for the downstream effects, both in terms of the pollution and the air quality and the effects on the climate system. And so there was a recent report um, that came out a little while ago uh, called Risky Business, uh, the Economic Risks of Climate Change in the United States. It was co-chaired by Henry Paulson and Michael Bloomberg. And so this is Henry Paulson here. He says, if we act now, the US can still avoid most of the worst impacts and significantly reduce the odds of costly climate outcomes, but only if we start changing our business and public policy practices today. He also said, taking a cautious approach, waiting for more information, a business as usual approach, is actually radical risk taking. And then Bloomberg said, the longer we wait to adapt and mitigate climate change, the more devastating the economic impacts will be. Oops, go. For example, between 66 and 106 billion of the existing coastal property in the US will be below sea level by 2050. And so in the, in the New York area, and Bloomberg was the former mayor of New York, of course they experienced coast, uh, Superstorm Sandy and, and saw the kind of damage that can occur uh, in association with a, a big storm surge. Um, and these kinds of events will become more common as time goes on. It uh, won't occur everywhere at once. It'll be very episodic. It'll hit one place and then another place. But the odds 
uh, of this happening in your place, if you're uh, on the coast, uh, increases over time. So I think we need a price on carbon emissions. This is the user pays aspect of things. I th as we've seen, there's been major costs. There are actually billions of dollars already to climate change through droughts, through the wildfires and the floods, the lives lost, the crop lost, uh, the crop insurance, wildfire losses, costs of fighting wildfires, property damage, uh, and so on. But the costs are generally not borne by those who cause the problem. Um, there are explicit and implicit subsidies for fossil fuels that do not make the playing field level for renewable energy. And I think the U.S. is a major part of the problem. And so this is um, just um, uh, what, a couple of weeks ago, uh, this is 20 September um, 2014 in New York City when the United Nations actually had a session dealing with uh, climate change and uh, there was a very impressive number of people, some 400,000 people marched for, for climate justice. So I'll leave it there and uh, open the floor to questions. Thank you. What's the relative change in the uh, ocean levels <coughs> due to uh, glacier melting and uh, temperature increase which expands the water? Uh, if you include all of the melting of land ice, which includes Greenland, Antarctica, as well as the glaciers, uh, currently it's probably about 60% of the sea level increase is, uh, is due to that, a uh, little more than half of the 3.2 millimeters per year overall. Um, so it's a significant number. Well, what happens when all the glaciers are gone? Uh, well, the, the, the glaciers on, there will be a time when the glaciers on land are largely gone, but Greenland will still be there uh, and Antarctica. Antarctica will be there for a very long time. The main part of Antarctica that's at risk is uh, the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, which is grounded below sea level, and therefore if drastic things happen there, uh, that whole uh, ice sheet could become destabilized. And uh, if that were to occur, um, sea level could rise by uh, something like uh, 20 feet or something like that over a few hundred years. Greenland, um, it, the odds are quite good actually that, that Greenland is going to keep melting and we may not be able to stop it even if we want to. <coughs> but the time for Greenland to melt entirely is something like 800 years. Um, so it, it doesn't vanish immediately, uh, but it has a whole bunch of consequences, as it turns out. You know, the, the profile of Greenland lowers, it changes the, the weather patterns, uh, it, it actually changes the sea level locally because the, uh, there's less weight on it from the, from the Greenland ice sheet itself. And the, there's a little bit of a rebound effect of the, uh, the lithosphere, the, the, uh, the Earth and uh, sea level, um, uh, and, and so that, that can have other consequences for the, for the overall sea level distribution uh, around the world. So there's uh, other complicated effects like that that, that uh, can occur uh, further down the, down the line as well. Thank you. Not sure, Kevin, good going. However, I disagree with you on a number of things that I'm not going to mention, but I have two short sentences and then a question. On October 1st, several global temperature satellite systems reported 18 years of flat or slightly declining temperatures in spite of increasing CO2. The other question, uh, statement is Luning and Barinhol, you probably have heard of, working with the solar cycles 23 and 24, show declining temperatures as well. So the question is, what bearing does this have on the, quote, missing heat, unquote, controversy? Yeah, so that, I addressed that uh, earlier on. You may remember I showed the slide where I suggested that more heat was going deeper into the ocean. And uh, before that, I had highlighted, in fact, that the, the temperature appeared to have leveled off. And so this relates to the disposition of heat. You know, how much heat is going into the ocean and where is it going into the ocean? If it's staying in the upper part of the ocean, then it affects our day-to-day -day weather. Uh, and the, the global temperature goes up. But if it goes deeper into the ocean, uh, 
and ultimately, you know, the oceans have to heap up, uh, warm up to, to keep up with what's going on at the surface. Uh, and so more of that heat has been going deeper into the ocean. Uh, but that may be stopping uh, this year. Um, as I say, this year is likely to be the warmest on record. Uh, the hiatus may be over. We'll have to see what happens, uh, say, a couple of years down the, down the road as to whether it's just going to be an El Nino blip and then go back again. But, um, and, and it's not something we can entirely predict, but uh, what is going on with regard to that plateauing? It's happened before and we can indeed understand the processes and, uh, and that it's associated with internal natural variability. And in the meantime, overall, the planet is warming, sea level is going to keep rising, sea level keeps rising regardless, and, uh, and better watch out. <laughs> got another question maybe. yes would you address uh, medieval ice uh, medieval warming period the little ice age and the fact that the Sahara desert periodically becomes a tropical jungle <coughs> so uh, if you go back 5,000 years you know the the main changes, there, there are large changes in the, in the planet's climate naturally. This is one of the things which geologists often point to. And the main changes are associated with the change in the Earth's orbit around the Sun. And so there are changes in the, in the overall shape of the Earth's orbit. Uh, there's a, a change in the, the tilt of the Earth's axis, which occurs on about a 40,000 year time frame. And there's the precession of the equinoxes. Um, which is when the, when the Earth is closest to the Sun. And that occurs on about a 20,000 year time frame. And, uh, and so there are uh, indeed, uh, you know, the last major ice age was about 20,000 years ago. And uh, the, uh, the warmest period on Earth, according to the, um, the, uh, the, the Sun-Earth orbit relationship, was about 5,000 years ago. And so that's when the last time the Sahara was relatively green. And it was very much associated with the, the changes in the, the Earth's axis and, and the rotation of the Earth around the sun. So these are, these are changes that occur on many thousands of year time frames. When you go back to, um, we, can, we can get some records reasonably, reliably, perhaps, back to about certainly a thousand years ago, maybe two thousand years ago. And so there was this um, relatively warm period in Europe that probably has been blown up in terms of its importance about a thousand years ago. Uh, and, um, and, and so there's been a, a lot of rhetoric related to that. But the best estimates are that when it was warm in Europe, it was cooler in other parts of the planet. In other words, that does not seem to have been a global warming, a global phenomenon at that time. And so we can see this from time to time now. Uh, in general, uh, over, over the period up to Sydney about five years ago, Europe had gone through a much more pronounced warming than the United States had. Uh, especially in the southeastern parts of the United States. It hadn't warmed that much. But Europe, had, Europe and, and Asia had actually warmed quite substantially, and that had gone on for quite a long period of time. It relates to the overall atmospheric waves and atmospheric circulation patterns. And so this is part of the internal variability and in the slowly continual adjustments of the atmosphere and the ocean interacting with one another in, in rather complex ways and the way in which they affect the storm tracks that in this case go, in, go into Europe and, and things like that. And so there was a period back in the, a thousand years ago where it seems as though Europe for a relatively prolonged period of time, uh, a number of decades at least, was relatively warm. But it seems like China was relatively cool at that time. And so, but the information is fragmentary. It, it comes from proxy records. You have to go and uh, get tree rings, um, dig for uh, or get coral cores in the tropics. Uh, actually, they don't go back that far. Try and deduce what happened in the past from various kinds of proxy uh, evidence. And so the information base as you go back that far 
becomes um, much more fragmentary. It's, it's not as good, and it's certainly not global. So uh, that would be my commentary on that. Uh, yes, I have the impression that the Arctic is warm is warming more rapidly than the rest of the planet. Is that true and why does that happen? Yes, that's true. And uh, part of it is related to this ice albedo feedback mechanism, which I also said is operating in the Rockies. And so when you melt ice, uh, especially in the summertime, there's less of a bright surface, which is reflecting the sun's rays back to space. And instead, there's a relatively dark ocean. And the dark ocean just absorbs all of the heat. And therefore, it, it warms up even more. And so that's one substantial amplifier that occurs in the Arctic. And it's sort of expected. But there's even more to it than that. And there was a really spectacular example just this past week. I wonder if I've got it here. Um, it's, it's not showing here, but I think I've got it hidden if we go to this. Whoops, not that one. Let's, let's, let's see if these slides will show. So this is sort of what happened over this, over this past week. This was November 8th this year. There was this spectacular storm, which was a little bit like the uh, superstorm um, Haiyan last year, except this one was called Nuri. It went through Japan and caused a tremendous amount of damage. It was a Category 5 uh, typhoon. Uh, but then it had a continued life. And it took on a life very much like Superstorm Sandy did along the East Coast. And it became an extratropical hybrid storm. This is on November 8th. This is on November 5th. So on November 5th, it was more like a classical, classical hurricane. But uh, at that time, this is the sea level pressure analysis of it. And it turns out the sea level pressure here was analyzed to have a central pressure of 924 millibars, 924 hectopascals, which is the lowest on record in the North Pacific. So this was uh, their version of, of Superstorm Sandy, if you like. But associated with this massive storm and the warm water that was in the Pacific there, there was a huge surge of warm air that went pouring up into the Arctic. And so let's try the next one. And so this is what. What happened, this is on November 12th, there was this great big huge wrinkle in the jet stream with, with this uh, huge amount of warm air that went up into the Arctic. And when that goes into the Arctic, what happens? The Arctic air has to go somewhere else. And it came down over the uh, eastern part, uh, over us actually, and, and into North America. So that this is what the temperature pattern actually looked like on November 12th. So we had this cold air all from the Arctic coming down here. But look at all of this warm stuff just off the west coast and up into Alaska. It was much warmer. You may have seen it in the news clips. It was much warmer in Alaska than it was anywhere uh, in, the, in this, this main part of the US and right up into, into the Arctic. And so this is sort of what happens. And, and so part of what has been going on in the Arctic is also related to events like this. The warmth that has occurred there is association with some of these wild storms that have occurred uh, in, the, in the middle latitudes that have brought very warm air up into the Arctic. And then once the snow and ice melts, it has some feedback effects that makes the Arctic uh, even warmer still. And what, do I have another slide here? Let's see. Oh, and then, of course, this is what happened uh, in Boulder. These are four hours apart, and the temperature, and here's, here's the record actually at NCAR. Now the temperature dropped from 64 degrees down to 37 degrees in two hours, and then 27 degrees uh, an hour later. And uh, you all experience this uh, in, 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 sub, in, in subsequent warmings. But in some strange way, this cold outbreak that we're experiencing is related to the warming of the Arctic. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so you've talked a lot about like in the next like hundred or thousand years, but uh, do you have any like um, sorry, what like present day um, both evidence and also consequences of global warming are there? I mean, it seems pretty cold to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, this relates, of course, to weather, and so I. I I took a, a little bit of time out to explain a little bit relating to weather, in particular relating to storms and the fact that storms can get more vigorous uh, 
as a consequence of extra water being in the atmosphere. And, and this storm that we've just seen, this uh, Nuri storm, was probably a case in point, that it was probably more vigorous because the warm ocean underneath and more water vapor getting into the storm that helps to provide fuel for that storm. And so this is one of the things which leads to increased volatility in, in some shape or form. Uh, but if we go back to, that, to this thing here, what do you reckon if you were to do an average over the Northern Hemisphere? Actually, I don't know whether you can see all of the Northern Hemisphere there, but there's probably more uh, uh, reds and oranges than there are blues. And it turns out that um, you know, the cold spots around the planet are typically occupying about, what, two or three spot, two or three percent of the planet or something like that. And as I said, this year is, is headed, October was the warmest October on record. Of course, this is November. November may not be the warmest November on record, but uh, September was the warmest September on record. July was the warmest July on record. Um, and as I say, 2014 is likely to end up being the warmest year on record. And so you can't just look at what's going on at your spot, um, uh, your location, um, if we're right under here. But, um, you know, you, well, they're going to get this. this. This is coming on Tuesday, what, today, tomorrow. Um, but um, uh, you can't just uh, confuse the weather with the, with the overall, overall climate and, and what the uh, environment that all the weather is occurring in. Uh, I guess you can call me skeptical, but like you didn't like the political ads, <coughs> I also didn't like the Alboa hype, and I'm not real happy with the, what I consider the climate change hype. Um, well, I don't know whether, tell me, is a lot of this have to do with the instrumentation and uh, test equipment the scientists have gotten in the last 40 years or 50 years with satellites and everything? And also, speaking of scientists, you had a statement up there that said 96 percent. 97 percent. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going 97. 97 percent of the world scientists, 90 percent of the polar scientists, 90 percent of the climatologists. What 97 percent of scientists? Well, it, you know, there's uh, several studies that have been able to replicate that kind of thing, but it does depend on the nature of the question that you're asking. And it's really the nature of the question that, you know, do we have a problem? Uh, the planet is warming. There's absolutely no doubt whatsoever of that. And, uh, and humans are responsible, primarily responsible for that. In fact, there's no other explanation. And, and yet, based upon the fact that this is a physical system, the heat has to come from somewhere. There is a physical cause of this. And now you can say and wave your arms around and say, well, this is just natural variability, natural fluctuation. Well, we can estimate what those natural fluctuations are. And uh, since 1970, the temperatures on the planet are way outside of anything that can be caused by natural variability. I uh, mentioned a few things along the way that with El Nino events, uh, the global mean temperature can easily go up by half a degree Fahrenheit, perhaps, and then it jots back down again. But half a degree is about the maximum you can get in one year out of natural variability. And if you then want to average out over a decade or something like that, you're down to about, um, uh, you know, a bit, well, let's see, the number I would say actually is about two tenths of a degree Celsius. So that's nearly half a degree, nearly half a degree Fahrenheit, I suppose, is about what you can get out of natural variability. And so uh, the overall global warming is about 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit now. Um, and we've got, I mean, as, as I said at the very beginning, the evidence is always not perfect. Uh, as you go back in time, there are fewer observations. You mentioned that the observing system has changed. We've now got satellites and new kinds of information that we didn't have before. But there's a tremendous amount of work that's gone on to try to relate the newer measurements to the old measurements. And one of the things that we're continually trying to press for with regard to uh, funding sources is the ability to um, to keep track of that in an adequate fashion. Those of you who know about DIA and, and Stapleton, you know, they used to take the records at Stapleton and then they moved it out to DIA. 
Why did they do it like that? I mean, it was a terrible way to do that. Why didn't they keep the one at Stapleton going, at least for a while, so that they have Stapleton and DIA going next to one another so that they could compare them, for heaven's sakes? Those are the kind of arguments scientists uh, argue for. Uh, but, you know, it costs a little bit more to do that. And it hasn't been done, uh, these kind of changes haven't been done the way in which we would like to see them. But uh, there's a tremendous amount of work that's gone into homogenizing these records and trying to get the best estimates of, of how, they, um, how the changes have occurred over time. And I've no doubt that there are some which are not so good because the sightings of instruments are not uh, the best. Um, you know, if you make a, um, what's the old story? A, a physicist uh, made a measurement of the temperature and he knew what the temperature was. And then he made another measurement of the temperature, and he was no longer sure <laughs> because he got a different answer, uh, right? And, and so how you reconcile all of these things and string them all together to get the kind of time series that I showed you, I mean, I have a lot of confidence in those, in those time series, and especially in the US. Um, if you look at rainfall records in other parts of the world, and especially Africa and South America, they're really deplorable, and we really don't know adequately exactly what's going on there because the records don't exist as well as we would like to see them. Um, and we, would, we keep making the case that, you know, why can't we at least keep these records going? Uh, one of the records which is in the greatest jeopardy right now is the streamflow record around the United States and around the world. Uh, the USGS and others are removing the gauges that are measuring streamflow, for heaven's sake. What a stupid thing to do. Um, and um, anyway, it's an ongoing battle to try to reconstruct the record and get it as best we can, and that's what I've tried to depict for you here. Thank you. We have time for just one or two more questions. We've got two questions over here. I have one. Um, I appreciate all your input from the scientific point of view. And, uh, being a former doubter, I, I'm, I'm more persuaded that what you're talking about is, is going to happen. But it was your comment later on about the carbon tax and the responsibility for the users to, to pay something. And my question goes to, what do you expect those taxes to do? Well, you know, there, there. Would, I, I, I just, how would it help to mitigate climate change by collecting taxes from users. If, if you saw the announcement from President Obama uh, from the G20 summit, he made a statement that the U.S. would provide three billion dollars to an international fund relating to support for adaptation of climate change. Um, trying to help other countries uh, build infrastructure that allows them to cope with climate change and climate events of all kinds. Cope. cope. Yeah, well, so, th I mean, the, the, co build, the coping is a key part of it. I mean, I, one, one of the things I highlighted here was, was storms and, and rain, and I think water is going to be the biggest pressure point around the world because the demand keeps interest, uh, increasing. There was a very nice program on 60 Minutes uh, this past uh, weekend relating to the drought in California and, and all of the mining of groundwater that occurs in, has occurred in India. And, uh, and so they haven't got adequate water to deal with their, their current demand. And the demand is increasing as the population increases, and yet the water supply is at best constant, and what I've described to you is in fact it's likely to be more volatile. We're more likely to see times when we've got too much and times when we haven't got enough. And one of the challenges for a water manager is how do they save the water from the times when they've got too much, when we've got the flooding, for, for the times when we haven't got enough, for the drought. And so one approach to that, of course, is to build dams and reservoirs and things like that which environmentalists don't like, uh, and which have other kinds of consequences. Uh, you know, one of the things that's happening is that the, um, the aquifers are being discharged. And so one of the questions that arises is, can you recharge the aquifers in some way? If you could do that and, and um, put the water back below ground, uh, 
it wouldn't evaporate. Whereas if you put it in a great big reservoir, um, it evaporates. One of the things that happened after 2002, which, which was really spectacular actually, was the number of lakes that occurred in farmers' properties and on golf courses. Uh, the golf course that I belong to, they, they ripped out all of their previous lakes, dug them about 20 feet deeper, filled them up with a lot more water, and now they've got a better water supply. But you know, this sort of thing uh, can happen. But these are the sorts of actions that one can deal with in order to build, make yourself more resilient to some of the things that, that might be coming along. And, and there are just a host of examples like that in, in all kinds of areas where you can uh, protect yourself and become uh, more uh, resilient, more immune from the vagaries of nature. If you like to think of it that way, you can prepare in various ways for wildfires and, and heat waves and, and, um, and so on. And, and so there is a lot of pressure to, to build this fund. What Obama did not say is where's this three billion dollars going to come from? Where's it going to come from? I mean the Congress isn't going to appropriate, appropriate it. Maybe he can get out of his foreign um, I, I don't know, but it would make sense to me if it was a part of whatever, I mean, I call it, I mean you can call it a carbon tax, but there are different ways of, of doing that in, in, in various ways. And actually a good example right now is, is cars. You know, I mean the cost of gasoline has gone down a little bit. Why do we let it go down? Why don't we just hold it at the same level and then all of that extra money just goes into this carbon tax, um, a, a pool. Nobody would, would notice, and, and then you have, <laughs> well, you know, so, so gas can't go down. It can just keep going. Well, one of the things I've suggested is, is that uh, what we need is, is a, a penny a tax on gasoline, a penny every two weeks. And you wouldn't notice it for the first week. And then, you know, after a year, you've got, what, 50 cents extra, right? And then you're beginning to notice it. What's the biggest effect if you did that? The biggest effect is that the next time you buy a car, you will buy a fuel efficient car. And that will put tremendous pressure on the, on the car companies to build much more fuel efficient cars. And I think you would see amazing things happen when that kind of pressure occurs. You're paying too much for a fuel efficient car. Well, you buy an electric car, right? Uh, or something else. But I mean, and so the key point is that it's the implementation of this, how you go about it. Just waving your magic wand and saying, all right, now I'm going to put a dollar gallon tax. That's not the way to do things. And politicians are supposed to find ways to make these things happen. And that's not what's been happening on Capitol Hill. That's my commentary. One last question. Yes. Do you have any data that shows the significant sources of carbon into the atmosphere? and the significant processes that removes carbon out of the atmosphere. Because there's been data from ice cores that shows the CO2 level's been as high as 800 ppm, and we've been bouncing between three and 400. Yeah, but that, I wouldn't, yeah, you can't trust that number. I mean, if the, the 400 parts per million by volume is, we, the best record we've got of carbon dioxide comes from ice cores in Antarctica and Greenland going back in Antarctica about 850,000 years. And, uh, and the, there are no values anywhere close to these values, uh, the current values in that record. The estimate is, and then you're going to different kinds of proxy evidence, the best estimate is to, to get back to the values that we've got now, you would have to go back about three million years in order to get to carbon dioxide levels that are higher than today. And if you go back further in time, certainly uh, values may well have been higher uh, than, than today. Um, there, I showed you one graph which showed you estimates of where the uh, carbon dioxide was coming from, the burning of fossil fuels mainly. But there are detailed studies of that kind of things, and and the most uh, there's quite a lot of information on the Department of Energy's website actually, if you're really interested in that kind of thing, and they have it all broken down by all of the sectors, uh, what part of the society and what part of North America is contributing, and 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 so on, and it's actually quite interesting, but it's not something I can answer in five minutes. <laughs>
Thank you so much for coming.